good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live on this Friday afternoon. I don't know where you are listening in the world. Please uh, pop in the chat and say hello. If you are live with us, tell us where you're from. Um, but today here in Boulder, Colorado, it is hot, hot, hot. It's dry and it's above 90 degrees. And I was just telling Gina, um, Full disclosure, I went on a hike this morning. It was amazing and I had a great time and I crashed. <laughs> I think that he just totally took it out of me. I'm back up and ready to go and got a little tiny bit of coffee here, some good clean coffee. <laughs> Super excited. I did not want to miss this. And I just say that because I was literally like lying flat an hour or two ago. And here I am because I um, am so excited about this guest, uh, Gina Taconi Moore. Um, hopefully I said that right, Gina. You did. You got it. Good, good, good. good. Um, we met through mutual acquaintance that it's um, master helps us with marketing and different things, but she said, you two have some things in common and you have to meet. So I was super excited. And even in our conversation, just the last few minutes, we found all kinds of fun things that we have in common. Let me introduce her. And then I'm going to jump right in. So uh, Gina is a pioneer in the world of manual therapy with knowledge that goes far beyond the four walls that house your primary care physician. Uh, she spends her time answering mystery, pain, and it's not magic, it's mobility is kind of one of the things that, that she goes with. You're going to learn a lot about her and why she's so special and why she's so good at what she does. I can't wait for you to hear her story. Um, she is an accomplished clinician, businesswoman, running her own practice. Um, and what's neat is the things that I, I can read all the great accolades that you have, but the things that I think are really special are our mutual acquaintance who introduced us said, she's one of those people that doesn't even need advertising. Like it's word of mouth. When someone gets helped by her, they tell people and it's, you help some pretty influential people. Um, so I hope it's okay that I, I don't read all of the, the bio, sure. got so many accolades to your name, but she still pursues CrossFit, weight training, literature, interior design. And we both decided we love going deep, reading books. Um, I was telling you before we started, I was, I'm like a secret closet librarian because <laughs> we have like introvert, <laughs> extrovert inside. So Gina, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. First of all, a lot of people are probably like, what, what is this? What do you do? We'll get there, but how sure. did you get to where you, you are now? What's the story of, you know, how you landed here? Sure. So, um, first, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so the story begins with my shins. Uh, in a former life, I was a sprinter. Um, short distances, anything beyond 200 was just not my, uh, my bailiwick. Um, but I had really, really nasty shin splints for about eight years or so. Um, and then I got it in my mind that I wanted to run a Tough mutter and knew that I was going to need something a little bit more aggressive than the yoga that I was doing in order to prepare me for that. And so I found CrossFit. And um, I had a very uh, adept trainer who um, was really kind of on point with his recommendations and stuff, um, very conservative as far as CrossFit goes. But I was constantly subbing in anything else besides running because it just hurt. And he said, look, it, you're going to run 12.1 miles um, with obstacles and stuff, but you're going to need to get your body fixed before you go and do this because you can't row and you can't air dine your way through a tough yeah. mutter. It's not going to work. Um, so I said, okay. So I went and uh, on his recommendation um, to this gentleman who did active release techniques. Oh, yes. And, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of familiarity, I think, in this space with that technique. Um, and I, you know, gave him what was going on and, um, you know, three or four fairly uncomfortable sessions later, I was about 80% resolved. And that was, I mean, the first time that that had happened because, um, you know, in high school, they would stick me in a whirlpool bath and kind of tape up my shins like a racehorse. And, you know, that was, that was sort of the end of it. Um, so oh, like a little bandaid <laughs> on the problem. Um, and the change was so profound with those visits um, that I was like, I have to figure out how to do this for other people. This is, this is crazy. So I found out that I just needed a license to touch. Um, so I pursued a um, course in massage therapy. And as soon as I got myself accepted to the massage school, um, I started signing up for active release techniques um, seminars. And before I graduated with my license, I was full body certified in ART. Um, and it was journey, like, right. Cause you're like, this works. I want to do this. I want to be licensed to be able to, that's amazing. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I just, it was, I don't do well with waiting when I find something that I really want. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so, you know, it was just, it seemed like a natural uh, progression to me. And I knew that I wanted to do something with a clinical focus that was going to be 
um, you know, sort of under the, um, the, the, you know, umbrella of wanting to help specific issues. So, um, you know, I give a lot of credit to folks who are in the space providing, um, you know, therapeutic massage for stress and reduction and that because that absolutely is required um, and it's, it's really, really needed. Um, but this, the stuff that I do is much more, um, you know, individual outcome focused. How much can we reduce your pain? How much can we improve your range of motion so yeah. that you can get out there on the 12.1 mile course and run the Tough Mudder or whatever it happens to be. Um, so in, in the midst of that, I was also opening my CrossFit gym, um, CrossFit Lowell, which I founded uh, 10 years ago wow. um, and has since um, has moved on, um, but it's still, it's still in functioning. And so if you're in Massachusetts, check out CrossFit Lowell. Awesome. Um, and, um, you know, so I found that being a CrossFit coach and being a body worker, a manual therapist, whatever you want to call it, um, was really complimentary because I could see biomechanically things working out on the gym floor and then see, you know, kind of consequentially what was happening in my clinic. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I went about and did that for a while and, um, had some wonderful mentors along the way, um, specifically Tom Myers, who wrote uh, Anatomy Trains. Oh, yeah. um, and that was really where I got my foot in the door with the dissection work that I do. Um, and so, you know, the approach now that I have developed, which is called interstructural release, is sort of a marriage between all of the work that I've done in the dissection lab, um, the work that I did as a CrossFit and Olympic weightlifting coach, um, and, you know, just the, the work that I've done over the past 10 years on, I don't know, thousands of bodies at this yeah. point. So, um, and it's just, it's sort of a culmination of all of that learning in addition to, you know, as we were talking about before, um, sort of standing on the shoulders of giants and this brilliant borrowing thing. So, um, so that's what, that's what I'm wow. trying to and clearly, I mean, I, I didn't mention, but I kind of wanted to make sure people know, like you have been a um, re renowned consultant with high profile sports teams, NFL, MLB, PGA, um, other sports people. Um, again, in this field, you are known and it's kind of what's neat is you've really taken kind of your own approach and pulled some things together. Like the, it's interesting, ART, I did not realize that was one of the faces because probably 20 years ago when I first started running, I didn't know anything about what I was doing. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this barefoot running sounds cool. So I got myself a pair of five fingers and I went out uh -huh. running. I had no idea. I totally was a heel striker. I got, um, you know, fracture, stress fracture in my uh, mm -hmm. calcaneus. So clearly was not running mm -hmm. right. And ART was the thing that actually helped me back then. And so I, I remember like a chiropractor who did it nearby and it was mm -hmm. one of those things like, okay, there's something really different here. So I totally know the power of that personally. And that was yeah. decades ago <laughs> and, and uh, understand again, I would have not been able to hardly walk for months were it not for that technique at that time. So you kind of taken that, made it your own. And then you just briefly mentioned the dissection, but this is what's so unique about you. Tell us more about like, you are like an expert. What do you even call that? And forgive me for not like a no. <laughs> no, I mean, dissector, I guess is, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. You know, is fine. Um, so, um, you know, again, in studying with Tom, um, you know, I think that he really attempts to take a holistic look at the body. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing so, you know, I, I've likened my job, um, you know, the, the job of the manual therapist in general as, you know, hearing a terrible noise in your car, driving it to the mechanic and saying, okay, I've got this terrible noise in my car and I need you to fix it, but I don't want you to put it up on the lift and you definitely can't look under the hood. So, I mean, wow. that's sort of what yeah, we have yeah. to do, you know? Um, and so being able to get into the dissection lab was a way to look under the hood. Um, and, you know, having those images that are not computer generated, that are not out of a textbook, um, that are just sort of behind my eyelids at any given moment has given me an atlas that I can utilize anytime I have a patient under my hands, which is really awesome. Yeah. Um, and really, I mean, particularly where the, um, the method that I've developed relies on separation of tissues sort of at the borders and margins and things like that having a really solid idea of what the topography of the inside mm -hmm. of the body is um, just makes the work that much easier, honestly. So, um, so that got parlayed. I did a, a, a bunch of labs with Tom 
Um, I did a few labs independently as well. And then um, I was invited to be part of um, the dissection team at the Plastinarium mm -hmm. that was creating the world's first fascially focused plastinate model. Wow. Um, so she's, she's, she's in existence now. Yeah. Um, her name is Freya. She's over at the Body Worlds exhibit in Berlin. Um, and, you know, we had these major um, non-reality based dreams when we were starting, <laughs> you know, everybody wanted yeah. to be able to um, essentially disarticulate the fascia from musculature and stuff like that completely. Um, the plastination process is a, uh, a fairly brutal one just on tissue and things like that. And so um, we sort of compromised by starting with various ish, uh, areas and showing how those are fascially encased or, you know, whatever. So, um, so it's not quite the full ghost body that we're hoping for yet, but give us, you know, seven to 10 years and we'll get there. Unbelievable. So is this a model or is this actually a real preserved, um, is it just a model, like a, a, a man-made model or is it actually a preserved tissue? It is preserved tissue. Okay. So, okay. um, it's a, it's a, it's a full body cadaver. Okay. Um, Yep. And, and like I said, the, the process of plastination is, you know, years long. So yeah. we started this process uh, about four years ago now. And like I said, she's, she's finally done. So. Wow. Okay. That's fascinating. I'm just like <laughs> loving this so much. And, and I can see how that totally um, gives you the ability to see or feel. And you mentioned just before we started to like this movement and the smoothness, and it's almost like if there's a tear or a rub or tell us more about, cause you can feel if things are, cause just like a, you know, well-oiled hip or a, a, you know, a cog and a wheel or whatever, you're going to have that smooth motion or you have this creaky, greasy sound, you know, sound. <laughs> so can you actually tell with the tissues on the exterior, like things are not moving like they should like little. And again, I don't know the vocabulary very well, but yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, basically what I, what I've said to my students and what I've said to, you know, um, patients as well is that healthy, well circulated, um, solid tissue feels like a freshly set bowl of jello. That's the secret. Yeah. And so anything that feels anything other than that is what I go after. So, um, and you know, I'll say that and people are like, well, surely it can't be that simple. It is yeah. because otherwise, you know, you can really kind of get lost in the sauce um, in the, you know, analysis paralysis sort of realm of things if you start thinking much more, you know, complicated than that. So, um, you know, the idea of this whole method is that somebody comes in with an initial complaint and it can be anything from carpal tunnel to plantar fasciitis to, um, you know, chronic lower back pain, all of that, I would kind of label that under the sort of more common things that I see um, to pelvic floor dysfunction and incontinence mm -hmm. and um, temporomandibular joint disorder and, you know, um, chronic headaches and things of that nature as well. So, um, you know, so somebody come, will come in with an initial complaint um, and say, you know, it's, it's this, it's my shoulder, it's my back, it's my whatever. Um, and so I'll start at that area, but rarely do I stay in that area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of, one of the sort of guiding tenets of this is that it's the victim that cries out, not the perpetrator, right? Oh, so the yeah. thing that hurts is not necessarily always going to be the source of your problem. Mm -hmm. It's certainly the source of what's causing you to yeah. not sleep or have to change your posture or whatever. Um, but what is maintaining that pain. And that ultimately is what my job is, is to find the source of that pain yeah. and attempt to resolve it. Wow. So often, like you said, probably knees are coming from hips or ankles are coming from hips or, you know, it's, mm -hmm. your elbows, lateral epicondylitis is coming from, I'm just assuming. Yeah. Can, yeah so, yeah. wow. Yep. So that's manual therapy. Fascinating. And um, I love how you've combined that. And the thing that I hear too, is you've got obviously an incredible analytical mind and you love to go deep and study, but you've also clearly developed this tactile sense, right? That's like probably extraordinary compared to the average person. Cause that's what you do. Like you yeah. use, and I always admire those people who take, cause that's like the right brain, left brain stuff, right? Like you've got mm -hmm. the tactile intuitive sense that you probably like trust that you, just like you said, if you think too hard and I do that in medicine too, it's in an interesting way. Cause I used to be purely analytical, but over time with experience, often I'll have kind of a gut feeling and then I'll prove it with the science, but it feels yeah. like to me, 
feels like literally like you're actually <laughs> getting very good clues from your fingers, from your touch, from your tactile sense, and then kind of thinking through the, where it comes from, but that had to be developed over time. Did you feel like over time, like how many years have you been doing this? So, um, 10 years at this okay. point. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, there is a funny story related yeah. to the sense actually. So, um, as I said, I started in massage school and, um, you know, we, we really launch into things right away. So within the first week we were, we had hands on each other, yeah. um, in the class and, um, you know, because ultimately with a, with a, uh, massage therapist, manual therapist, you know, um, it's that, it's that haptic sense. It's yeah. that perception that is really what sets us apart as well from, you know, other folks who are doing good work in this field. Right. Um, you know, in chiropractic school, in physical therapy school, um, places like that, there just isn't the emphasis that there is in massage school with yeah. developing these as your primary tools of assessment. Right. Um, because truly, you know, we don't, in a traditional massage school setting, you aren't getting a huge amount of education about orthopedic tests or anything like that. So you really are taught to rely on these yes. very portable tools that you have with you at all times. So it's the second week of my time at the massage school. And, um, you know, we're, we're working on finding, um, it's sort of the point of physical innervation at the, at the trap up yeah. here. Um, some people might call them trigger points. So, um, you know, I've got my partner down and I'm working and I'm working, working. And the teacher is saying that these are, you know, they're pretty obvious. You're going to find them no problem. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't find these anywhere. And so I wave her down. Um, she just comes gliding across the room. She's yeah. talking to another student and literally just puts her hand out and lands directly on my partner's shoulder. And she goes, ow, that's it. And I said, oh my gosh, oh. I'm never going to be that good. <laughs> yeah. do that. that is remarkable. But um, you know, so that was, that was a little bit of humble pie right out of the gate, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like anything over time, when you get used to using yeah. a tool in a certain way, um, you become adept with it. And my tools just happen to occur at the end of my wrists. Yeah. So, um, and it's funny because I was having a discussion with my husband not too long ago, um, just about perception and stuff of the hands. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I was like, he was working on me. That's what it was. He was working on me. And I was like, gosh, you're so pointy. I taught yeah. you better than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh -huh. Pull out and start again. He's like, well, but I can really only feel at the very tips of my fingers. And I was like, really? Because I mean, my point of contact and this yeah, is why I can yeah. when I work with someone is right along the side of my finger or sort of, you know, right in through here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even realize that that was the point of the most sensation in my hands until a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about it. Yeah. So, I mean, in college, I did a course in reflexology and I, for a short time, I did that for, you know, just a little extra on the side. And so uh -huh. I remember very clearly, we really targeted this little section of the thumb on the side where you could get mm -hmm. more pressure, but also feel, again, I'm no expert, but I remember <laughs> that little bit and I'm like, oh yeah, that makes a total sense. Yes. Um, yep. That. So, so let's talk about patients. Um, tell us a story of someone that was, and it sounds like a lot of people come to you who've been, that's the commonality with us too, is like with our mutual acquaintance was like, you both are like these mystery medical mystery people who <laughs> people have been everywhere, tried everything and they haven't gotten the help they need. So I can totally relate, but tell us about a situation where maybe they've been places or they were getting ready for surgery, or maybe they've been post-surgery and they felt like they were, um, you know, unhealable and sure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's really my bread and butter. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so the one that comes to mind is, um, I was working with a first responder, um, and in major city, um, and this person came to me on a Monday and said, okay, here's the deal. Um, I've got surgery scheduled for Friday, oh. same week. Yeah. Um, you, you got two days. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. No pressure. This is great. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, you know, so what they were recommending was because he had a uh, chronic low back pain. Mm -hmm. So what they were recommending was going to be, um, a, a laminectomy on actually a double laminectomy, but on the same side. So it's, it's lateral. Um, and, um, you know, he was like, I really don't want to do that. I have young kids. I want to continue to be active in my work, you know, um, so for him, it was his livelihood and also just his ability to have a good quality of life with his family. 
So again, like there's what decade, like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, what kind of he, he was uh, early 40s, okay. yeah, early 40s. So yeah. um, and, uh, you know, and he had tried, according to him, fundamentally every conservative measure under the sun, um, you know, been to chiropractors and physical therapy, and he'd done, you know, all of the kind of like cryo treatments and, you know, he's like anything holistic I could think of, I tried. Right. Um, and he had gone and he'd been to a neurologist and a pain specialist. And the pain specialist basically said, look, you know, when are you going to start taking this seriously and actually fix it? Yeah. And so that was really what kind of prompted him, bullied him maybe yeah. into surgery. Um, and so he was like, you know, I, you're my last ditch effort um, before I get cut on and I really don't want to. So, you know, what can you do? Um, so again, starting with the initial area of complaint, which was on the left side of his back, um, you know, I felt around and yeah, there was maybe like a little bit of tightness, but certainly nothing I'd write home about, right? Um, and so I just, you know, kind of followed the tissue down, uh, you know, sciatic path kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, you know, I'm in through glute and piriformis and down through hamstrings and so forth. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I really am not finding anything remarkable in here. Maybe I can't help him, you know? So, um, I sent him home. I was like, look, you know, you're going to have some residual soreness, just get in touch with me in 24 hours. Let me know good, better, and different how things are doing. So, um, in the meantime, I went home and I'm now racking my brain because I don't like failure. And I'm like, I, I can't, I, I have to figure this out. Right. Um, and so I really just, I like to draw schematics of the patients I'm working with that I can't solve on my whiteboard to just draw out the structures that I think are involved and then look at what I might be missing with, you know, my trusty netter textbook or something like that. So, um, at any rate, I went home, I thought about it and uh, realized that I had fundamentally skipped over his entire adductor group. Um, so I was like, okay, well, that's something that I can check. I've got a little breadcrumb now, right? Yeah. Um, so when he called me, um, he's like, yeah, I'm probably 20% better. You know, I'm not sure. I'm like, none of that matters. I missed something. Yeah. So come back in <laughs> yeah. because we checked all of the obvious stuff in that path. Um, but I missed the, the stuff that was maybe secondary or even tertiary. So he comes in, um, you know, checked on, cause I like to do just a subjective pain scale with folks before we start. And he's like, yeah, I'm probably at a six right now, which is, you know, that's yeah. better than moderate. So, um, and, uh, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to just sort of look down into your adductors and see what we got here. Sure enough, there is a, a spot, um, in the adductor magnus, which is the big one that's kind of like in the middle of the meat of your leg. It's called the adductor hiatus. It's there on purpose. It's basically just a hole that allows mm -hmm. um, nerves and vascular structures to pass through. Um, and so I look at that and I'm like, man, this thing feels like it's got a zip tie around mm -hmm. it. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is, you know, it's a bit of a crapshoot, but let's yeah. just see what we can do. So I worked through um, the hiatus and was, I mean, I felt the, the neurovascular bundle just yeah. do that, like travel all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Um, and he went, holy crap. And I went, holy crap. And so mm -hmm. cleaned up uh, a little bit more, just, you know, kind yeah. of doing due diligence down into the lower compartment of the leg and all of that traced my steps back up to the lower back. And I was like, okay, um, get up off the table, see what yeah. you think. And he got up and he was like, it's gone. The pain is gone. He's like, and he's bending and moving. Yeah, he's like, that? Oh, exactly. Wow. Because, you know, one of the things that I, I ask my patients to do most of the time um, is, you know, if I feel like I'm at a place where I've gotten to a certain resolution, I'll say, okay, try to make it hurt. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. that's they sort know of that exactly. <laughs> yes. They yeah. know what movements right. um, they can do to produce the, the symptoms that they're having. So he, I mean, this guy is all but cartwheeling all around my, my yeah. office to try to make it hurt at this point. <laughs> um, and he's like, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. So um, I was like, okay, so let's just not jump the gun. Do me yeah. a favor, wait another 24 hours. And let's just see if yeah. this thing, you know, has settled in. Basically, if, if the body has accepted our suggestion, right? right? Um, and sure enough, a day later, he called me and he was like, I canceled my surgery. So, 
Um, I love yeah. that so much. And it sounds like, again, with that, my familiarity with ART, it's like entrapments, isn't it? I mean, there's, it's, I'm sure it's way bigger than that, but the, at a core level, a lot of times these things just get trapped and yeah. you're releasing them from captivity. <laughs> Bingo. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. just a, it's a stickiness thing that, you know, the body has thousands of gliding surfaces and the key word there is gliding. They are intended to do yes. this on each other. Um, but you know, if the body all of a sudden gets the message, usually from a joint yeah. that there is some cause for alarm, like if there, you know, if there's a perception of instability as a, for instance, um, you know, then because the body is smart and adaptable, sometimes to its own detriment, <laughs> um, it'll step in and start laying down additional layers to wed these things together so that now rather than multiple structures moving as multiple independent structures, you have more or less like four cased sausages wrapped yeah. up in saran wrap and nobody's going anywhere independently. Yeah. Um, this one pulls this one with it and like, oh, that, yeah. Okay. Yes. Makes, again, it's so interesting because again, as a physician, I know anatomy, but not like you do. And <laughs> certainly not to the, the, the thought process. I mean, I'm not anywhere near anything what you do, but I'm so fascinated because I understand the process behind mm -hmm. why it works, why it makes sense and why you're so unique because of your background of the intense knowledge about dissection. I mean, that just gives you this I, I bet you're one of the only ones in the world. You, you've got to be the only person like this. That really, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. And I love that. And I'm sure you have many other stories you could tell us like that, because that's what happens when you have that kind of unique face. How cool. Um, yeah. As you said in your, um, in some of the stuff you gave me that you think there's three unique bodies. What does that mean? And tell, tell us more about when you perceive that the unique bodies that a person that you see has or a patient or a client. Yeah. So, um, you know, this again is just sort of extracted from my own time and in, in the yeah. field and so forth. But, um, so, I mean, I encounter the fascia body, the fluid body and the breath body. So, you know, and the, those cross every conceivable system yeah. that we have, um, because you really, you can't, you know, when, when people say that they're, um, like fascia specialists or something like that. Well, yeah, anybody who puts their hands on another human body for therapeutic purposes is a fascia specialist because you can't contact anything without contacting fascia, like just by proxy. Yeah. Um, so that is, I mean, it's it's truly a ubiquitous structure in, in the human body. Um, but then again, so is fluid. Um, you know, we've got all of these different um, highways and so forth some of them with their own pump like our circulatory systems and some of them you know do the brilliant yeah. thing yeah. like lim yeah. like lymph right so um and then you know the breath that's one of those things that um you know over the course of time i've just come to realize how critical good breathing techniques are um and how bad most people are <laughs> at this really really basic very life-giving sort of thing um, and so, you know, when I encounter a particularly difficult case, and this ultimately is sort of where, um, you know, the, the three body yeah. theory purview sort of came through, um, which is that, you know, typically I'm starting with fascia, which, you know, because you've got every single cell, every single muscle, every single muscle group, and then your entire body sort of encased in this particular material, it's really easy to start there because you kind of have to, you know what I mean? You're contacting it regardless. So, um, so, you know, that's sort of my first line of defense is the fascia body and the restoration of gliding surfaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes that'll get somebody to 50% better or 60% better, but not a hundred percent. And so that's where I'll start to look at, um, things in a more granular way. So more of, you know, like, okay, well, let's check out your fluid exchange. You know, mm -hmm. do you have like boggy tissue at your ankles that we need to look at? And, you know, that's a, a really good indicator that maybe your lymphatic flow is not necessarily where it should be. Um, and then, you know, after we've checked that box and if the person's still at like 50, 60, 70%, um, then we'll look at the breath body and it's like, okay, so you are moving fundamentally everything, certainly in your thoracic cavity, um, when you breathe and, you know, you know, a lot of other things sort of go along for that ride. And so, um, you know, let's look at how deep you're getting your breath, um, where you're getting it to. Let's look at your lung expansion. 
Um, let's feel how your organs are moving. Um, you know, because organs articulate in a very certain way when you breathe and you your hands on them, you know, as they're breathing, mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a ton of yep. sense. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, I tend to leave the breath for last because it really, it's, it's intimate as well. I mean, you know, it's, it's very, very rare that people are getting hands on sort of in that oh. thoracic cavity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and typically it's because something very invasive is about to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, just out of, out of respect for, uh, the way that I feel that the treatments should unfold, that's sort of the, the last thing so that we've already established a rapport and I'm not just like diving into your abdominal right. cavity, you right. know, like uninvited basically. So I love that you say that though. Cause I, I, I have a massage therapist in my clinic who's amazing and she does abdominal massage. Um, and, but I've gone to hundreds, maybe thousands of other massage therapists and rarely do they ever touch, which is perfectly okay. I get mm -hmm. why, but it's one of those things like the psoas and some of those things you can't get to yeah. except for through the, you know, through that cavity. And I've always found it profoundly helpful to my low, you know, so it is oh, a, yeah. really such an important place and it's pretty much ignored all this. And again, again, it's like the dog, you know, if you put your belly up, this is the most vulnerable part of ourselves. Right. That's right. So I yep. still get why. And I think that's super respectful of how you practice, but it's also like, if you're out there and your massage therapist has never touched your abdomen or you have a great relationship with them, that's a really powerful place to get healing. Like Absolutely. I and I mean, look, if you're out there and you have a great massage therapist who you trust, yes. just ask them. That's because exactly also, great. No, right. You're trained in it. It's just yes. a, a, the, like you said, the intimacy a lot of you are really nervous or they get, or they have the reflex you know, the uh, rectus abdominis is like, yeah. because, like, don't, don't go there. But anyway, yeah, I love that absolutely. you address that. And the breath is huge. The thought is coming to my mind as you're talking. So here I am like in my clinic with these complex chronic, it would be inflammation, infection, toxicity, all those kinds mm -hmm. of things, but it's going to manifest in the tissues. And my expertise is using the mind and the testing to do that. I'm not touching the patients as much, but clearly you are. And can you tell whether it's a post-infection or some sort of inflammatory condition? I'm sure you can actually see and feel the tissue difference there too. So even if you weren't like looking at a lab value, you, would you be able to like, say we were working together on the same patient, would you be able mm -hmm. to tell me? Yeah, there's a lot of inflammation or there's some because of the feel, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say yes with an asterisk because yeah. I operate in shades of gray exclusively. Yeah. There is no black and white, <laughs> but um, yeah. So for the most part, um, and you know, look, as you know, uh, markers of inflammation walk in lockstep with each other. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody has, um, you know, uterine fibroids and IBS and yeah. swollen ankles and um, you know, chronic lower back pain. Okay. Well, you know, maybe we need to look at elevated factors of tumor necrosis factor alpha or something like that. Right. Which by the way, nobody's doing blood tests for those for people with lower back pain, which is insane. But at any rate, I'm going to get totally off agree with you. That's a whole nother topic, <laughs> but I totally agree because I think it's like the structural issue where there's a weak link. Right. But then on mm -hmm. top of it, that inflammation is what kind of takes people over the edge often. And whether it's infection right. or toxin or poor posture or poor breathing or. Yeah, so. absolutely. So to answer your original question, there are some cases that, you know, like the, the markers of inflammation in the body that are palpable are, you know, things like heat. Yeah. Um, if things feel particularly boggy, mm -hmm. um, if things are especially stubborn also, that's another one. Yeah. Um, you know, a, an interesting thing that I've discovered over the, the time in this field is that, um, you know, working on people who are chronic smokers is very, very difficult for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that firstly, um, their tissue globally, muscle tissue yeah. tends to feel, um, very much like beef jerky, I guess. Um, and, um, you know, with that also, even when I do sort of restore some circulation to tissues like that, it doesn't stick. So yes. for people who are active, well hydrated and good breathers, yes. that those, you know, I see them maybe four or five times and then they're off my caseload. Um, but for people who have, you know, inflammation markers or, um, you know, are heavy users of intoxicants or nicotine or stuff like that. Um, what I found is, like I said, that, you know, the, the, the quality of the tissue is just that much worse. Um, and it won't take the same way that it would in a body that is otherwise well hydrated and um, not using intoxicants. So 
So I love that you mentioned the smoking because my one experience in medical school, of course, we had cadaver lab for six months and we each had our own cadaver that we worked with the whole time. Mm -hmm. That was aldehyde, not like the the difference with you with the fresh, you know, it's very different tissue we were talking about too. But the one I remember is we had a smoker in his fifties who died of a heart attack. And I remember like compared to my colleagues' cadavers, the heart was just one big, very, very thick, not pliable muscle. And there was Mm -hmm. no lungs were these chunks of black. And, mm-hmm. and our and our colleagues who had non-smokers were still soft and friable, very mm-hmm. different, very, very different. And then all the arteries we dissected, like even it was so clear, they were like plastic tubes. Yes. So, so, so I, I, that little bit that I remember, I was like, I remember so, and I've never smoked a day in my life, but uh, it was so visual that I was like, I will never, ever be susceptible to cigarettes because I can mm-hmm. see how big of deal. And I think what you're describing too, is the hypoxia that happens. And we see that with other infections too, but when you have tissues that aren't getting good oxygenation, it's going to absolutely affect all of these things. Right. And especially pain because that oxygen takes away, you know, delivers nutrients, but also takes away debris and junk and garbage. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the, one of the labs that I was at, um, you know, we were, we were here. Um, so we didn't, we were in this country, what I, what, yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So we didn't get a medical history, um, just based on the body donor program. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that sort of became part of the intrigue of the, of that particular, particular, particular lab, um, because we had one, uh, cadaver who, I mean, I would put him probably, I don't know, mid to late sixties or so. Um, but we were all convinced that this was a COPD patient because he had the massive barrel chest. I mean, yeah. the heart that like yep. filled and then yes. overflowed yes. both hands, exactly. um, which as you know, is not normal. No. Um, <laughs> and, Cardiomyopathy. Uh, and it's funny because I'll just mention that because even this for young men who are like using steroids or whatever, I've seen a number of young 30s, 40s, where there's massive hypertrophy and people think, oh, these muscles are great, right? But you can mm-hmm. have your heart and it can't pump anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. The other thing that, you know, because you were asking about, can I feel kind of the inflammation? And it's interesting yeah. that you bring steroid use because I can absolutely feel a steroid user because their muscle feels um, literally inflated. It's like squeezing a, a beach ball as opposed to squeezing somebody who has earned it the traditional yeah. way. I, Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, people might be pulling the wool over eyes of folks at the beach, but not when you get into it. Um, one other thing I get found really interesting in your bio and some of the info you gave me is some things that you wouldn't think for someone, a manual therapist would be like uh, erectile dysfunction, incontinence, constipation. And for mm-hmm. my patient population, small bowel um, overgrowth, uh, bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, or something with a mild obstructive kind of pattern where it's adhesions and stuff. Tell mm-hmm. us about those cases. And it sounds like those, you can often get them in and out in a three, four, five sessions and have success. That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, my right now, I really love working on visceral stuff and, you know, and you may find this too, that in your practice, there are kind of seasons of things that show up where you're like, okay, it's raining, you know, like left wrists this, this week or something like that, you know? Um, and so in the, the past 18 months, the focus has really been on, um, pelvic floor dysfunction, which would include, you know, I'm going to kind of umbrella that to include sure. ED, to include yeah. incontinence. Um, and then, you know, bowel issues yeah. like constipation as a, for instance. So, um, you know, the, the easiest way to be able to sort of figure out what's going on, um, with somebody with some sort of a gastrointestinal upset that is, mechanical and not chemical or disease related in nature. So I just want to put that asterisk out there um, is that, you know, basically like your colon is more or less forming a bit of a rectangle with a shoot at the end of it. You know what I mean? And so um, I'll start just by listening um, with a stethoscope to just hear what, you know, is going on at like the cecum, for instance. Um, which if you're listening and you're like, what the heck is that? That is sort of the gateway between the small and large intestine. Um, And then I will, you know, look up sort of into the corner of ascending and transverse and then to the corner of, you know, all of that other stuff. Um, And just sort of see like, okay, if I'm getting noise at the cecum, which I typically am, Mm -hmm. um, then where am I not getting noise in response to pressure? Mm -hmm. And so that's typically where I'll start is just, you know, um, more or less like lifting the margins of the colon 
um, to just see, you know, is it stuck to the greater momentum? Is it stuck to uh, the, you know, the peritoneal wall? Is it, you know, is it stuck to itself? Is there an adhesion somewhere internally? Um, and generally speaking, I can find that, um, you know, through palpation um, and certainly through patient reporting, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, exactly. on, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. I'm relying on the person um, who's under my hands to be able to, to help and, and guide me. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the cool thing about that, um, without kind of wandering into a too graphic territory, is that when I've got somebody in front of me who's constipated, um, I can feel where the blockage is residing. Um, and we can really physically kind of like inspire some motility yeah. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the large intestine. Um, and I mean, you know, I've had people get up in the middle of sessions to be yeah. like, okay, it's right now. Yep. <laughs> yep. Know? Yeah, no, totally. It makes so much, I mean, that's what our body, and so from a clinical perspective, what I see a ton of is small intestinal, either bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth. And it's all of that ileocecal region. Like you said, if that flap is stuck closed or there's a mm-hmm. heat or there's no motility there. It's almost like um, that flow uh, between meals and things where you should get cleansing and mm-hmm. clearing out of the bacteria is not working. So you don't have the, mo- we call it migrating motor complex is not working. It's not mm-hmm. clear between meals, but a lot of it is to do with this manual piece of there's old surgical adhesions or old stickiness from yeah. maybe a peritonitis or something going on there. And so when you manually actually kind of break up those adhesions and allow for movement, I find again, clinically, I can do all the medications or the herbs or those things, but I would say 50% of the time with the small bowel or the large bowel issues, it needs some manual therapy. So Mm -hmm. I I see that too. And I think it's so powerful um, because that stuckness, no medication, no no herb, nothing is going to fix if there's an adhesion where two pieces of the bowel are stuck together and not moving well. Right. (laughs) That's right. Exactly. And you know, the piece that um, you look at is both mobility and motility. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of an inside outside sort of thing. So once again, we're back to the fascia body um, and to a lesser extent, the fluid body and yeah. to a lesser extent, the breath body, because all of that is yeah, all together. Up. Absolutely. And in, in, you know, healing that particular region. Um, and so, you know, we have to make sure that not only are the exterior gliding surfaces of the structures not stuck to other gliding surfaces of other structures, but also that the smooth muscle inside is doing its job as well. Um, and you know, that, that also, that's sort of where the breath comes in. And so I'll send people home with some rehab stuff to do, um, because your breath really helps to, again, inspire the, the motility piece that is, you know, directly in the smooth muscle tissue of your bowel. So, um, and then, you know, as far as the, the pelvic floor stuff goes, that started, uh, you know, my curiosity developed really early with that. And it goes back to my CrossFit gym. So, um, you know, at that point in time, there were not a huge amount of female coaches and even fewer female owners. Um, and so it was a unique experience to have one of my younger, and I mean, like early twenties, not a childbearing person, um, come to my door and say like, Hey, so, um, I just did a heavy deadlift out there and I peed a little, Um, don't know what that's about or you know it was box jumps or it was jump rope or it was now I love you say that because I bet there is 50 percent of the women listening out there that have had that experience and it's so yes. shameful to talk about I mean nowadays you talk to your girlfriends or whatever but it's so common isn't it yes <laughs> yes and that's exactly so that's really the the drum that I've been beating for so long is that it is super common but not normal so let's fix it yes. let's talk yes. about it first off let's demystify it right and- <laughs> And so, you know, that really, the fact that I had all of these very fit young women coming to me and saying like, I'm being myself on a regular basis, um, led me just, you know, to look at some um, osteopathic journals to understand better what the pelvic floor was and, you know, and all of that stuff. Um, And what came out of my research was that fundamentally the argument in this one paper, there are uh, like four conditions that the pelvic floor can be in. So you've got your kind of like high and tight, you've got your low and loose, which is, you know, what I think most people would associate with pelvic floor dysfunction or incontinence. Um, and that would be the case of, you know, women who have born children, um, and particularly vaginal births and that kind of thing. Um, and then you've also got, you know, sort of like the low and tight and high and loose, right? So you've got all these different kind of Mm -hmm. Um, conditions that a pelvic floor can be in. And by the way, 
since reading that article and since just doing my kind of anecdotal study, there's way more than four. There's exactly. so more than four. <laughs> so that was sort of a one size fits most model, but it worked well yeah. enough for me to start with just a little, you know, kind of case study thing with the, the female athletes in my gym. Um, just knowing what I knew from dissection lab again. So again, if you're a manual therapist or a body worker or a yoga teacher or a gym teacher or you know a coach or anything like that, and you can get yourself to a dissection lab, please go and do it because it is going to be so edifying and so life-changing for you. So that's my plug for dissection labs. Um, but at any rate, what I learned in the dissection lab is that we've got, um, muscles that are part of our deep six lateral rotator in the back of the hip that fundamentally are like the, if you picture it, like your pelvic floor is a hammock, mm -hmm. these are sort of like the trees, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, and so if it's the obturator internus, and so if they're really tight, what will happen is that the trees will fold in and, you know, you've got kind of this like lower hanging pelvic floor at that point. It doesn't mean the pelvic floor is loose though at that stage. Because especially if you are bearing down a huge yeah. amount, as in weightlifting or whatever, or you're doing something percussive like running or jumping, um, then you're going to be, you know, you're clenching basically. And, you know, if I put a pencil in your hand and said, okay, I'm going to give you $100 if, you know, you don't let me pull this out of your hand and you're squeezing, 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 and I pull it out there's no more strength left in this yeah. hand. You, yeah. you can want to squeeze yeah. <laughs> more, yeah. but you're not going to be able to do it. Why? Because you've already maximized that muscular potential. And so the same is true of pelvic floor incontinence in people who are otherwise not childbearing and very fit. Yeah. That those muscles are in contracture and yeah. they need to be released. Yeah. Um, it's the opposite so of what you think. It's not more kegels. It's exactly. <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. 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 Oh, because that really, and particularly at that point in time, and you know, we're, we're going on, uh, I don't know, eight or eight, seven or eight years ago at this point, that's what was available literature wise was right. just, you know, just one thing, one size all, right. <laughs> yes. no, I do that clinically too. And I'm not the expert. I always, you know, send them to someone like you or a physical therapist, but it's very true. It's not a one size fits all. And a lot of women are real frustrated because they're like, well, I really do my kegels. I know how to hold the pelvic yeah. floor and I still can't, you know, protect from loss of urine with right. exertion or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yep, exactly. Wow. Um, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I love, love. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> <More cases. laughs> um, any last bit of wisdom? I mean, you're so unique. First of all, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening here who are going to want to get a hold of you. And you were telling me your website and stuff is being built. So that's coming, you know, Correct. all the data and stuff, but we'll make sure people can still find you. And I'll, no matter when that happens, we'll make sure that that is wherever you listen to this, we'll link that up. And it's your name, right? Which, um, yes give us your name and spell it for us really quick so that sure. if you are audio, so look it up. Yeah. It'll be Gina Ticcone more.com G I N A T A C C O N I M O O R E.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that'll be where, you know, you can find out what I'm doing and, uh, book a consult with me and, um, just generally kind of step into this very nerdy anatomical world. I love this nerdy anatomical world. I love that you encouraged anybody listening, doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, anyone to think about dissection and anatomy, because I, um, again, my, my experience is 20 years ago and it's pretty rusty. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because most, um, you know, people assume that doctors are, you know, but even for me, sometimes a muscle, I'm like, what, what muscle is that again? Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's muscles, not nerves and all the other. And of course I sure. do all that at one time. So you are encouraging me to go back to that too, and make sure that it's all fresh. Any last bits of, um, you know, just giving someone hope or parting words of wisdom or any last little bit of pearls that you want to leave people with? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I would say, um, especially having worked with some populations that have really seen a lot of life, you know, people who, um, have survived catastrophic injury or illness um, and, you know, are still struggling with some of the after effects of things like that all the way to, you know, somebody who's like, man, you know, I just, all I want to do is be able to control my bladder. Um, I would just say, you know, think outside the box a little bit, think from a, uh, an anatomical perspective, my to practitioners, please think about things from an anatomical perspective. Um, you know, Oliver Sacks was beating this drum way back in the day and all yes. he did with case studies. Um, and, you know, his encouragement was to really bring 
the patient and their story to the forefront of treatment and prevention. Um, and so that would really be, you know, kind of the soapbox that I would get on for anybody who is in the business of treating any human bodies is just put your patient in front of you, keep them in front of you. And if you're smart enough, they will teach you how to treat and cure them. Oh, I couldn't have said it better myself. That is so beautiful. And so, so I, no wonder that our mutual queen is like, you guys got to meet <laughs> really truly that listening and I can hear that and even the fact of the story you told us you like went home you drew it out you're like I'm gonna figure this out good for you I um I know that you're you're already so successful you're just going to continue to catapult <laughs> and, as far as, and what I hope is you get a chance to continue to teach people and really mm -hmm. spread this method and the things you've done so thank you so much for your time today Gina it has been such a pleasure. yes definitely this has been great